internationally acclaimed mezzo-soprano Joyce DiDonato captures opera audiences with her artistry and commitment to character. Her voice embodies the emotions of the role she's portraying and sometimes even her own. Two weeks after my dad's funeral, I was singing the role of a boy who loses his father. I sang it screaming, moaning, wailing, crying about the very experience I was living in real life. I find the act of singing to be deeply healing. You're listening to Speaking Soundly, the podcast that explores the art of artistry. I'm your host, David Krauss, principal trumpet of the Metropolitan Opera. As a musician in New York City, I get to perform with some of the world's greatest artists every night. During each episode, you'll hear me speak with these inspiring performers as we lift the veil on talent to hear about their process and the personal journey that led them to the stage. You've been an operatic superstar for a long time now, so I guess you're used to captivating audiences wherever you go. But do you remember the first time that you were really able to affect someone with your voice? I mean, the first memories I have are both high school-based and one was in my concert chorale, which was the epitome of everything for me. It still kind of is in some ways. We did the Kyrie from Bach B minor mass. And my dad was a choral guy. And my dad, after the concert, was sort of like shook because it was pretty high level. But I think he didn't ever expect that to come from a high school choir. And I remember him being sort of shaken in a, in a good way. And then I remember the experience of singing in our graduation, there was a, a anthem that the choir sang every year. Just all couldn't finish the song, we were crying so much. And it was, of course, you know, adolescent emotionalism and all of that, but it was also the power of singing together and the sense of community that that brought. So they were both choral based, actually. And do you miss those days of being in a chorus? I mean, it's definitely different than what you normally do. Sometimes you're the only person on stage. It's true, except I'm one of those believers that even if the soprano is in the center stage singing, there's a lot of teamwork behind what has happened to get her to that point. I think that impact early on of, of the group effort, it just, it's never left me. That I will say, it's what prompted me into music. So it, it was really, it's my foundation, choral music, and I still love it. So something like Maria Stuarda from the Met, when we had that big preghiera, the prayer with the Met chorus, and it was just, that's one of the most staggering moments I've ever felt on the stage. Mm. So I want to ask you about the development of your voice. I know it takes a long time to develop specifically an operatic voice. Can you take me back a bit and tell me what the process was like? So my junior year in college, I shifted gears I continued my ed degree and I got certified in elementary and high school education, music ed. Um, but my mind and my heart were starting to go towards opera in my junior, senior year. And I stayed a fifth year at university to do that. And then I spent three years at a conservatory in Philadelphia, the Academy of Vocal Arts. And then I got into the Houston Opera Studio for two years there. And my training in Houston ended when I was 28, but I couldn't find management. Um, I was doing competitions, but being told I didn't have anything to say as an artist. You know, I was not on a fast track to stardom. And I kept working and I kept studying. And in my first year out of the studio, I went to cover Jennifer Larmore in Giulio Cesare at Chicago. And the cast was Renee Fleming and Natalie Desay and Rockwell Blake. It was amazing. And I never went on, or I, I, I did one rehearsal, I think. But I was in the corner with, like, all the good covers, you know, not saying anything. And I had a shift mentally because I worked really hard over those years and I trained really well for the role. And I just remember thinking internally, I was like, you know, if I have to go on and stand next to Miss Fleming and Miss Desay and stuff, I think I can hold my own. Uh, people would still get their money's worth. And it was a mental shift that turned for me. Well, that's a huge shift. Was that 
confidence something that happened right on the spot or was it something that you had been working on? You know, it snuck up on me and it just, it occurred to me, like, if I had to go on, I'd be okay. Meaning, I think I'm ready. And I think that happened because I was such a, uh, I was the tortoise, you know, and I had to do a lot of work without a lot of reward. Just the carrot was just enough in front of my face that kind of kept me going. And then uh, around the same time, I had a good friend who told me, you know, Joyce, in this business, you're either famous before you're 30 or after you're 30. And I said, okay, I can wait. I can wait. And then a year later is when my big debut started in Europe. I was 30, 31. And it was, you know, La Scala in Paris and London. And it wasn't happening in the States, but in Europe, I started in, in the major houses. And Met career, Met debut didn't happen until I was 35. I was there. I was playing. Oh, I guess I was 36. Oh, yeah. you were in the pit. True, You're true. Kidding. I was there. You killed it. I mean, it was your debut and you were completely at home on this huge stage. It was impeccable. How did you manage to bring it on a night like a Met opera debut, especially the technical aspect of what you do? You've been working on your technique uh, for years before this moment. Well, I mean... Yeah, and that beast of of technical challenge raises its head. It's not like you get it and then it's done. You know, we're like athletes working on their golf swing or their tennis stroke or when they jump off the starting line is in sprints or things. So it's always refining. And there are moments that, that things that used to be easy are now hard and other things that you used to struggle with, you don't have to think about anymore. Um, I personally never have reached a point yet where I wanted to stop or quit. I would always kind of find a mental way around that hurdle. And it usually was a little bit of grace in terms of just be patient, like you're going to figure this out. And then also impatience of like, come on, get, get this. I know you can get this. And I, I think sometimes a path in music is balancing that impatience for perfection and and to get the piece learned and to learn the role or whatever and and patience because you have to let your brain you have to let your body catch up to the desire and sometimes it's a balancing act between those two things right and watching you balance those things on stage is amazing and it's bewildering because training to be an opera singer is a completely different ball game than an instrumentalist. I mean, opera singers will train well into past their 20s, into their 30s. What were those later years of training like for you? So my first lesson when I joined the Houston Opera Studio at 26, the voice teacher heard me sing for about five minutes and he said, Joyce, you're singing on youth and muscle and it's going to last about four or five years. And I was just old enough to really trust that there was truth in what he was saying, because I knew it wasn't easy the way I was singing. So I put myself in his hands to deconstruct and rebuild. And at the end of my first year of the Houston Opera Studio, we had to do a um, thank you gala showcase thing for all the sponsors that had been paying our salary all year. And I sang Non Più Mesta from Cenerentola, and I cracked all three of the top Bs. Just cracked them, one after the other. And this was in front of all the sponsors and everybody. And my teacher came up and gave me a big hug. He said, I'm so proud of you because you didn't try to control it and you let it go. And he goes, that's so important. That must have been a difficult moment for you. Did you take what your teacher said to heart? I mean, oh, 100%. I was crying, but I knew he was right because that was the process we'd worked on all year is let go, let go. If you control it, you can keep it from cracking, but it's the payoff is not going to be there. You're going to continue to dig in in the wrong way. That moment could have sent you running for the hills. Oh, it yeah, but I had to go through that. It was embarrassing and I was humiliated, but I also, there was something in me that said, it's okay, because this is part of the process. You're going there. And I was always early on, I had my view 10 years down the road and not one year down the road. And so that next year working with him, because I had sort of faced the worst case scenario, I made a lot of progress. And 
then the technique became more and more dependable and I knew what I was doing. And so when it really hit, that, especially that moment in Chicago, but then the big debuts that came, I knew I was ready. I knew that the technique I had built over those three years in working with him was solid. And that gave me confidence. That solid technique is what helped build my confidence. Well, it worked because when you're on stage, you exude confidence. I'm curious if you have that confidence in everyday aspects of your life too. No, no. I have always said this, that the stage and music have been my best teachers throughout my life. I've had good teachers as well, but consistently that it's been the best teacher because you have to face your demons. You have to, you know, you're on a ledge when you're on stage and it forces you to either sink or swim, you know, for that was like three different cliches in one sentence, but, right. but it's all true. Um, and if you don't find a confidence, even if it's a, a false bravado to even get you through the performance, you just can't really sustain anything. And I had to learn it. It didn't come easy, but it was based on figuring out my technique. Because if my voice could be in service of what I wanted to say, all these ideas I had, all this imagination, what I want to give to the audience, what I want people to experience, those things can only follow if the voice can respond. So the minute the voice started responding and I started trusting it, that confidence came like an avalanche because all of a sudden I was expressing musical things that I couldn't do before and people were responding. People were having emotional reactions as, you know, following your first question. And that prompted me to say, ah, oh, no, they get this. So, so it wanted me to give more and more and more. And the rest of my life has had to catch up, but I've had the barometer and the guide of, of what it feels like on stage to be free, to let go, to not judge, to be in the moment, to be really present. I've used that, um, so, yeah, barometer um, and have tried to figure out the rest of my life via that. And do you think you would have had as much success as you've had if you were one of those make it before 30 people? Thousand percent no. Hmm. Because the work that I put in before 30, which was really significant, it gave, gave me ownership of my technique, of my artistry, of what I wanted to say. At that one time I got that, that um, quote that I had nothing to offer as an artist. I had to examine that and say, why would somebody say that? Clearly, they didn't get it. And I could be mad and belligerent. Oh, well, they're blah, 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 blah. And, you know, and I, wa I was, to be very honest, for a little while, I was mad and belligerent. But that doesn't bring you growth. That doesn't provide you anything tangible to work with. And so I really examined it. And he was right. I went into that competition, a good singer. I was 29 at the time, 28, 29. A good singer, very well coached very well prepared. I mean, that American, you know, glossy, perfect thing. And I was playing the role of a well-prepared singer, but I actually wasn't clear on what I was presenting myself. I was doing what the coaches had told me, what was expected of me. And it was good, but it was hollow. And so that was an excruciating moment to live because I felt like he was cutting out my artistic soul. But it also was a wake up call. And I said, well, that's the last time anybody's going to accuse me of not having something to say for better or for worse. And it sort of jolted me into artistry, I think. Genuine artistry, not, not um, well-coached artistry. Right. Well, I've witnessed that genuine artistry because when I watch you sing on stage, you completely disappear. Like you're only left with the character that you're bringing to life. I'm curious what that is like from your perspective, though. When you're singing, do you feel like you or do you feel like the character? Or, or is it both? Oh, God, that's such a good question. When I'm in the groove and when I'm in the flow, I'm the character. I don't, I'm not one of those people that then walks off stage and I'm still in a fog. I can be Joyce 
100% right up to the minute I go on the wing, if I've rehearsed it well, if I'm good. But the minute I'm on the stage, I'm Sesto, I'm Agrippina, I'm Cherubino, and it's real. And that, that comes from one of the best pieces of advice I ever heard from a director, Leonard Folia. I was singing Dead Man Walking with him. And we achieved something really special in the rehearsal room. And it was like we were doing a play and it was so open and trusting and, and it was just magic. And before our first stage rehearsal, where we were, went on the stage, I pulled him aside. I said, Lenny, don't let me start doing that opera thing where I start, you know, making it big or get out of, out of the truth of it. And he looked at me, he said, Joyce, there's only two things that exist on stage, that which is true and that which is false. And something can be 98% true, but it's still false. Right. And that's, that's the litmus test for me. And I think, you know, part of it is, I don't know, it's probably very self-serving because I don't like to look stupid. And opera can be so stupid. If it's just a bunch of people screaming at each other and saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. And watch how I do this and watch how I do this and look me twirl my cape and oh, it's insufferable and I hate it. But when you respect it and you respect the audience enough to go there, the only place I can exist and have it make any sense inside my head is to go there 100%. It's the only reason I can justify the music and singing, screaming on pitch. Otherwise, I can't justify it. Now, I don't always achieve that because sometimes I'm struggling in a show or my mind goes off and I get out of the groove and then I'm Joyce. And I have enough skill that the audience probably doesn't notice it so much when I, if I drift in and out of it. But I hold myself to a high standard. I don't like that. And I, I don't allow that very often. Mm. Can you do me a favor and describe... Because it's, it's superhuman what you do. Can you describe what it's like to be one voice singing over a huge orchestra to a packed house of 4,000 seats? I mean, what's it like physically to be able to fill a room with that much sound? So I love sports analogies for singing. And I love watching athletes. And when I'm in the groove, I don't feel anything. It's like watching Roger Federer when he right. swings or Tiger Woods. You know, when it, the ball is hit perfectly, you don't feel any effort because all the aerodynamics, all of the, the physicality, it's all working in perfect motion and the ease of it is extraordinary. And it, when I'm in the, <laughs> the zone, it's quite hollow here. I don't feel anything happening. I sense the right kind of tension in my body that is holding it and the appoggio, the, the support. And I feel it just going out. Sometimes it's at the top of my head. Sometimes it's out my eyeballs, but it's, it's trajectory in that direction, but there's no sensation where the sound is coming from. And that's glorious. It's like, you know, you're on a sailboat and the wind is just taking you and you're just no effort. And when I'm out of the groove, I start to feel it. And that's the first indicator that come on, Joyce, you, you're off your breath you're off your breath. And so then you have to try and reset and recuperate on the next phrase and get back to that freedom because it's all, all the breath. And when the breath is released and flowing, you're on, literally on air, you're floating on air and it's euphoric, it's exhilarating. And that's where the power comes from because you feel like the, the breath could expand or concentrate. It could take you in any direction that you want to go in. Mm -hmm. You know, as an instrumentalist, we're always being told to sing through our instruments or to play vocally. We're aspiring to be singers. What do you aspire to sound like? I want to be like a cello. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I use that image a lot. It's the, the dream to be Ella Fitzgerald, that she could, you know, um, transform into any instrument to fit the color, to fit the mood. And do you ever copy other singers? I sort of purposefully avoid the imitation of other singers because I can be a really good mimic 
And that gets me into trouble because I start manipulating my sound to try and sing the way I think they sound. And so I purposefully steer away from that. But I love to play with the sound of instruments and melting in and out with them. You're also an amazing vocal coach. I've watched your master classes, and it's really inspiring to see you work with these singers. It's like you know this exact little thing to have them do, and it makes all the difference in the world. Does this ability to diagnose and just say exactly the right thing, does that come from your own experience of singing, or does it come from a method that you, either you've studied or, or come up with yourself? If there's a method, I'm, I, it's not intentional because I, I'm essentially improvising through those things because I don't know what we're going to do until I hear them. Right. You know, I, I, I don't know what the material is. And each day it's a very different beast that's mm -hmm. there. So, I mean, I, I think my method is target one or two things that I think can shift in the course of a 20 minute, half hour session, and then try to figure out how to get there. But it is clearly tied to my process because it's how I um, process things. And I think it comes down to clarity. What's the intention? Where are you going? Why does this phrase need to be sung? Why? And if it's not clear, it will only come out as sound, which could happen on any instrument. But we have text and we have subtext and we have to have a reason behind that. And it's been so interesting because, you know, I'm the first to say the plots and the dramaturgy of these things that we do are a little bit far-fetched. But I have yet to find a false emotional beat in an opera. Maybe it's silly, but that doesn't mean the emotion is not true. Mm. And that's where I find the clarity. So, so maybe that's my method. So as a performer, your ultimate goal is to impact the lives of the audience members that are listening to you. But what does music and singing specifically do for you personally? How has it impacted your life? Well, I mean, in a, in a silly way, it will save you a lot in therapy. I think it is, I think it's an incredible therapeutic tool. I think it's an incredible tool for growth, but like real growth, because you have to, you have to learn how to let go and open yourself in a way to really let your voice out. You have to let go and open. And that's what sells so many self-help books. And, you know, people are searching and searching and searching for it. And it is such a concrete, scary, fantastic, exhilarating, again, I use that word, tool to, to teach you to let go and open. It's also at a very, a level of physics, vibrating, the sense of vibrating from your own instrument that goes through every cell of your body. It's healing. There's study after study about that. So it's just in your shower, in tune or out of tune, rock and roll or pavarotti, whatever it wants to be. The physical act of singing is detoxifying. It's cleansing. And you do it. You feel it and you come out and you feel better. I had a, I mean, an extraordinary, uh, personal experience. I was in Paris two weeks after my dad's funeral and I was singing the role of Idamante. So we start the conversation with my dad. We'll finish with my dad. I was singing Idamante, which, you know, is the, a boy who loses his father. And there's a excruciatingly painful aria. I've lost him. And I sang it and it was really updated staging and I was curled up like basically in the fetal position, screaming, moaning, wailing, crying, and singing Mozart about the very experience I was living in real life. And to this day, I'm not quite sure still how I did it, how I got through the performance. I remember the, the first performance, the curtain came down and I just exploded into tears. But I realized that afterwards, it was such a gift, especially because it was Mozart. But 
that grief was working its way through me without even my being able to process it at all at that point. But it allowed it to move and not congeal and get stuck. And it had to almost be regurgitated out because it was coming out loudly. (laughs) But through the harmonies of Mozart and the line of Mozart, and I just think, I think that had a profound effect on me, being able to process it that way in public. And so I find the act of singing to be deeply healing. And I think it's, I think it's medicinal. It can be medicinal. Well, it is for me, and I'm sure for anyone who's lucky enough to hear you. Oh, lovely. Thank you so much. I'm really touched. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Speaking Soundly. Be sure to subscribe, rate us, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. To keep up on future episodes, follow me on Instagram at David Krause Trumpet and go to our website, artfulnarrativesmedia.com, for show notes, links, and information on all of our guests. Tune in next week as we hear another inspiring artist speaking soundly. Music